investigations that are routinely performed in neurological departments. Some are more specific like CSF analysis, neurophysiological tests, EMG, NCS, EEG studies, sleep studies like polysomnography, evoke potentials uh, like real work potentials, auditory work potentials, somatosensory and other tests like imaging tests, CT, MRI, PET, SPECT, angiography, these are routinely performed in other specialties as well, but they have more and very important role in uh, diagnostic as well as in therapeutic way in neurological disorders. Biopsy, like nerve biopsy, muscle biopsy is also routinely performed for diagnostic purposes. Laboratory tests like screening test of drug levels, urine toxicology, and genetic testing like in case of Huntington disease, other many disorders in dystonias. But these genetic tests are not so much common in, in our part of the world. In addition to these specific tests, routine tests like blood CBC, urea creatinine, electrolytes, these are also very important tests. It is not that only these tests are uh, mandatory for neurological patients. We routinely perform other tests that help in diagnosis of many infective as well as other disorders associated with neurological dysfunction. To start with CSF analysis, CSF analysis includes CSF simple DR and DR a detailed reporting, what we do, we check for CSF glucose, WBC count, protein, and CSF pressure. These are four important things that we see in uh, simple CSF GR. Any CSF analysis starts with GR, and it hints or points to our certain uh, important neurological disorders, and then depending on DR, we can proceed for different other uh, testing in CSF. In addition to DR, we also go for routinely, especially in case of when you are suspecting some uh, infective pathology in brain, staining is also done like gram staining, acid fast, bacilli staining for tuberculosis, and also staining for other fungal infections. PCR is also important from CSF samples for detection of various infective pathogens like uh, herpes simplex virus infections in uh, viral encephalitis as well as other bacterial infections. Culture sensitivity is again a very important test in CSF analysis as well as antigen antibody detection test for different uh, infective organisms. CSF testing is not only important for only infectious diseases, it is also equally important for other diseases like degenerative brain diseases uh, and demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis. CSF, as you know, it is produced by choroid plexus of ventricles and it is absorbed through villi of granulations into the uh, dural venous sinuses. Production rate of CNS, uh, sorry, production rate of CSF is about 0.3 ml per minute, which is around 20 ml per hour. So in 24 hours, about 450 to 500 ml of CSF is produced. While at one time in your brain and whole spinal cord and subarachnoid space, only 150 ml of CSF is present. 25 ml is in ventricles, while other uh, is distributed in subarachnoid space as well as in uh, uh, spinal canal. So 125 ml of CSF is almost replaced three times per day because the production rate of CSF is 0.3 ml per minute, which is 20 ml per hour and around 450 ml per day or 24 hours. So there are many taboos surrounding CSF analysis. You will see when you are practically in neurological wards, patient will refuse to give you sample, 5 ml sample of CSF. They think that it will produce deficiency of CSF in their brain. This is a diagram showing uh, the production of CSF from choroid plexus of ventricles and its circulation in ventricles, foramen, subarachnoid spaces, 
and through this again it uh, is absorbed in rectoid villi and, and venous sinuses and again from venous sinuses to blood veins like jugular vein and from jugular veins to blood uh, to heart and lungs and again through arterial circulation back into choroid plexus and from choroid plexus uh, CSF is produced again. This is more clear chart you will see here. Lateral ventricles, third ventricles and fourth ventricles. This is here. This choroid plexus present in lateral ventricle, third ventricle as well as in fourth ventricle. It produces CSF which is present in these ventricles and from these ventricles especially from fourth ventricle through lateral and medial apertures it is uh, distributed in subarachnoid space surrounding brain as well as spinal cord this is a spinal cord and this this is subarachnoid space surrounding brain and from this subarachnoid space it is again absorbed through uh, these uh, arachnoid villi of dural venous sinuses and CSF comes in these sinuses from these sinuses CSF is again distributed back to blood through internal jugular vein jugular veins and here you can see through this venous blood it comes in heart and lungs and from heart and lungs through arterial circulation again it comes to different ventricles through these granulations you cause choroid plexuses so uh, this is production factory of CSF and through ventricle in subarachnoid spaces and through subarachnoid spaces in uh, venous sinuses in venous through venous sinuses it comes in again into arterial circulation and back to brain this is a cycle of pathway of CSF flow basically to show you simply Lumbar puncture, very important test for uh, CSF sampling. So, how you perform lumbar puncture? For this, uh, patient's position is very important. Your patient lie in lateral recumbent position with legs flexed up over abdomen. Level you choose is L3, L4, vertebral interspace. Here you can see in this diagram, this is L3, L4 level. Usually the spinal cord ends around L1 and L2 levels. Here, the spinal cord usually ends. So this is a safe space to enter for sampling of CSF. And its level is at the level of anterior superior iliac spine. So you pass needle through interspace between two vertebrae on posteriorly. And the position of the needle is directed slightly rostrally, not cordially slightly rostrally to coincide with these spinous process that have downward angulation and you can see the patient position lying in lateral recumbent position with legs flexed and up over abdomen there are different contraindications for CSF sampling or lumbar puncture like when you suspect there is increased intracranial pressure or there is some space occupying mass lien which may cause cerebellar or cerebral herniations if you go for CSF sampling. Again, you have to see uh, CBC count in which very important it is. You have to see platelet count. There should not be thrombocytopenia because it increases the risk of bleeding within subarachnoid space or if there is some impaired coagulation this is also contraindication for CSF sampling CT scan is always performed before going for lumbar puncturing especially when you are suspecting increased intracranial pressure or some space occupying mass lesions. but in cases of exceptional cases of suspected meningitis when patient is uh, unconscious comatose you are clinically strongly suspecting meningitis you can go for CSF sampling uh, before CT scan if CT scan is not available urgently. This complication, low pressure headache, is very common in patients with uh, 
uh, after this uh, LP procedure. And this complication, low pressure headache, it can be prevented by uh, lying patient flat position. Uh, patient should be told to lie in flat position for about 30 to 45 minutes. You have to increase flood intake for this patient after LP and caffeine is found. For example, caffeine is also present in tea. Caffeine is also very helpful to prevent this low pressure headache. Interpretation of CSF. Normally, CSF is uh, clear colorless with glucose content of around two thirds of blood glucose. Protein is about uh, 45 or less than 45 mg per deciliter, and WBC count should ideally be less than 5 per microliter. Opening pressure of CSF is around 60 to 150 ml of water, sorry, millimeter of water. These are different results of CSF when compared to normal CSF. You can see normal CSF is clear in appearance with pressure of around 90 to 180 uh, millimeters of mercury and WC count is around 0 to 8, protein 15 to 45 and glucose 50 to 80, depending on blood glucose level. In acute bacterial meningitis, CSF appearance is slightly turbid. Pressure is increased. WC count is highly raised in case of bacterial meningitis. It is in thousands, surely. Protein is also markedly raised, like it is between the range of 100 to 500, and glucose is ideally decreased in acute bacterial meningitis. Compared to the viral meningitis, CSF appearance is more clear or more normal looking CSF in case of viral meningitis. Uh, and pressure of CSF is usually normal or sometimes slightly increased. WBC count is also raised in case of viral meningitis and usually it is in hundreds or between and even it can be uh, in no or uh, low normal range. Protein is also increased, which may be mildly increased in case of viral meningitis. So the main difference between acute bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis is appearance. This WBC count, which is highly raised in acute bacterial meningitis, and it is slightly raised in uh, viral meningitis. But the differential in acute bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis is more helpful in differentiating these two uh, CNS infections. In case of acute bacterial meningitis, uh, neutrophils are predominant, while in case of viral meningitis, lymphocytosis is more common. Tuberculous meningitis, third most important uh, CNS infection, and usually uh, in our settings in JPMC, we do not go for detailed PCR, culture sensitive testing. We augment our clinical judgment with simple CSFDR, and it is in majority of cases helpful. So you must know about CSF finding of acute bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis, tuberculous meningitis. In tuberculous meningitis, again, CSF pain is slightly opaque or cobweb formation. Pressure is increased usually in case of uh, tuberculous meningitis, and cell count is also increased usually in hundreds and more lymphocytic picture. Protein is definitely increased in case of tuberculous meningitis and glucose is decreased. Fungal meningitis and cephalotic infections, again, you have clear uh, appearance of CSF. WC count in fungal meningitis is also increased with lymphocytic picture or some many times mixed picture and you may have increased protein content in case of fungal meningitis like 50 to 300 mg per deciliter and glucose can also decrease in case of fungal meningitis most uh, important investigation in imaging uh, that is routinely performed in neurological ward is ct scan ct scan is uh, considered a screening test it is not really a very advanced, detailed and neuroanatomical test, but it is very important screening and emergency test. 
What is CT scan? Basically, it is X-ray attenuation by tissues. And what is attenuation? Attenuation is basically a removal by absorption or scatter of X-ray photos if they pass through tissues. And it is quantified on an arbitrary scale that is uh, represented in shades of gray. So basically, the more the dense tissue is, the more uh, X-ray attenuation by that tissue. For example, bone is more dense, so it causes highest X-ray attenuation and it appears hyper dense on CT scan. While air is very less dense, it causes least X-ray attenuation and it appears hypodense. Like normally in X-ray we see. So here you can see this is bone surrounding brain parenchyma and you can see this is very hyperdense. So the maximum X-ray attenuation is here. I'm oh, sorry. Followed by this parenchyma and then CSF. Very less hyper uh, attenuation. So bone appears hyperdense. This is gray matter, which more, which is more uh, hyperdense. This then this black. Here you can see this black white matter. Compared to white matter, these gray matter areas appear more hyperdense. This is white matter, which is black, and this is CSF in ventricle, which is again is very hypodense. This is the example of intracranial bleed. Here this is basal ganglia bleed. You can find on left side of this CT scan and it appears like this bone. It can only be differentiated sometimes from calcification by uh, these household CT scan quantification by various units. Sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between calcification and bleed, but bleed is a very common emergency. And usually CT scan, plain CT scan is diagnostic test and it is easily recognized on plain CT scan considering the clinical diagnosis, uh, keeping in mind the clinical uh, condition of the patient as well as findings, usually it is not difficult to identify bleed. Here, this is normal CT scan, you can see. Here in the ventricles, you can also see this is bleed, basal ganglia bleed leading to intraventricular extension. This is again CT scan, this is showing ischemic infarction here. This is hypodense area compared to this on the left side. You can see this is more hypodense shadow, and this is suggestive of some ischemic insult to uh, brain uh, and the distribution of right middle cerebral artery. Again, this is hypodense shadow in basal ganglia on right side, likely developing hematoma. So, CT scan can be axial or coronal study. When you perform contrast study, you have to give iodine. And if patient has uh, allergy to iodine contrast, then we do MRI instead. Contrast enhancement indicates local disruption of blood-brain barrier in the brain, uh, in the CT scan. Initial investigations used in variety of acute neurological disorders like a stroke and CT scan is usually contraindicated in pregnancy, but in emergency situation, it is not absolutely contraindicated. This is coronal study of CT scan. This is axial contrast study. You can see contrast filling the vessels. This is uh, basically for comparison, this is normal plain CT scan. And this is also uh, a CT scan axial image, but it is post contrast image. Here you can see some edema uh, because there is, you can see partial effacement of cortical sulci over here. While here you can see this contrast enhancement 
in throughout brain parenchyma uh, which is suggestive of meningeal enhancement in subarachnoid spaces there is csf and if there is in subarachnoid spaces you find meningeal enhancement it really suggests some contrast enhancement secondary to meningitis What is the difference between CT and MRI? MRI uses radio frequency pulses, not X-rays. While in CT scan, we use X-rays for imaging. So images in MRI, they result from varying intensity of radio wave signals, which emanate from tissues in which hydrogen ions have been excited by a radio frequency pulse. And patient in MRI is placed in magnet and then a radio frequency pulses are administered through MRI machine. Time to echo and time to repetition, these are advanced concepts, really not necessary to understand at your level. But these are very important two parameters and depending on these various sequences of where uh, MRI are performed like T1 weighted images, T2 weighted images, flare weighted images. In MRI, we perform uh, contrast studies with gadolinium. This is uh, MRI scanner uh, image you can see here. This is a radio frequency coil that produces these radio frequency signals that are transmitted through body and are cached by this MRI scanner. What are different MRI sequences? T1 weighted image, basically in which there is short uh, TE and TR. What is TE and TR? Time to echo and time to repetition. Basically in T1 weighted image, fate is bright, water is dark. Water, for example, CSF, it appears dark. A utility of T1 weighted image is usually for contrast enhancement. This is T1 wet image, you can see here, this is subcutaneous fatty tissue outside the skull that appears hyper intense compared to this hypo intense CSF signals. This is ventricle and you can see here in ventricles, uh, CSF appears black while fatty tissue appears bright in T1 wet image. And this is exactly contrast to T2 weighted images. Here you will see CSF is bright here, while fatty tissues are black or hypo intense. CSF everywhere here in T2 weighted images is bright, like in ventricles, like in CSF spaces here. So the difference between T2 and T weighted images is here, here you can see it. The main difference is this uh, CSF in T1 weighted images, CSF is black, and in T2 weighted images, it is bright or hyper intense. You can easily identify either it is T1 weighted image or T2 weighted image, and it is easily identifiable through CSF brightness usually. There is other sequence, flare sequence. It is also basically T2 weighted image, except CSF is black. Here is flare image. This is T1, this is T2, and this is flare image. T2 and flare image are same, except CSF and T2 is bright. It is uh, hyper intense or black in case of flare. While it is same, hyper intense black in T2 T1 weighted images also but there is difference of white matter here and gray matter signals when you compare to flare and T2 weighted images in flare and T2 weighted images here you can see white matter white matter is hyper intense while in case of T1 weighted images white matter is more hyper intense compared to this gray matter areas or uh, cortical areas. 
this is also very important MRI sequence diffusion-mediated image which def, uh, demonstrates cellular toxicity with high sensitivity usually in case of acute stroke. Cellular toxicity occurs in acute stroke. So diffusion-mediated images are very sensitive for these uh, uh, acute stroke findings. Uh, usually what we find, we find areas of restriction diffusion which appear bright on this image. Here you can see normal diffusion-weighted image. This is abnormal diffusion-weighted image in which you are finding this subcortical basal ganglia infarction uh, in case of uh, acute stroke. And this sequence of MRI is very specific for acute stroke detections. Usually in early stroke, within hours, within minutes, you can find uh, this finding on this sequence of MRI different weighted image and, and by other like T1, T2 weighted images you won't find any findings uh, acutely in case of strokes. So utility of MRI is it provides better anatomic definition. It is imaging of posterior fossa and cranial cervical junction is more better imaging uh, compared to CT scan because CT scan is uh, usually not a test of first choice when you are considering pathology that involves posterior fossa or cranial cervical junction. As we saw it, different weighted image, GW images are the most sensitive for demonstrating early cerebral ischemia and is also useful in evaluation of patients with suspected stroke. MRI is modality of choice in pregnancy. It is uh, safe when Contrast imaging is required. MRI may be preferable to CT scan when there is history of allergy to IV contrast or liver disease. And what are the contraindications? When there is metal object uh, or pacemaker, defibrillator devices, pacemakers, for example, in case of ischemic heart disease patients, this is also contraindication for MRI. Some patients have claustrophobia or some type of phobia associated with narrow tunnel uh, that patient goes through in case of MRI. So in these patients also, it's very difficult to perform MRI study. Then coming to EEG, electroencephalography, which is a test that detects electrical activity of brain through scalp electrodes. Brain cells like myocardial cells communicate via electrical impulses all the time when you are sleeping. So for myocardial cells, we perform ECG. For brain cells, cortical cells, we perform EEG. This activity is displayed on EEG paper as wavy lines. This is simple diagram to show you uh, these are the electrodes placed, connected through wires. And these electrodes are placed over the scalp and they detect superficial brain electrical activity underlying these electrodes. Here you can see these are the, uh, this is a section of the scalp on which the electrode, EEG electrode is placed. Here underlying are the cortical brain cells, especially pyramidal cells. Because they have active synapses, electrical currents are detected via these EEG electrodes placed over the scalp and they are amplified through EEG amplifier and displayed on the screen. So basically, EEG detects superficial cortical electrical activity. It doesn't detect deeper electrical activity of the brain. Normal frequency patterns of EEG are alpha rhythm, beta rhythm, theta, and delta rhythm. Usually alpha and beta are more active rhythms and normally in active state or in simple resting state, you will find these rhythms. Alpha is 8 to 13 hertz and it is found most predominantly in posterior head region when patient is in a relaxed state with eyes closed while beta rhythm which is more higher frequency in the range of 14 to 30 hertz it is more predominant in frontal head region and it is dominant rhythm in relaxing awake state uh, sometimes with eyes closed theta and delta are slow rhythm 4.4 4 to 7 hertz and 3 to 5 hertz and usually in drowsiness or deep sleep you will find these rhythms 
so awake with mental activity mainly you will find beta activity of normal adult brain waves which is in the range of 14 to 30 hertz awake in resting or eyes closed state alpha activity is more predominant 8 to 13 hertz while in sleeping state theta brain activity electrical activity is more predominant in 4 to 7 hertz while deep sleep you will have more slow delta activity which is less than 3.5 hertz how electrodes are placed this is called uh, montage montage is basically pattern with which electrodes are connected to each other on the scalp bipolar electrodes and differential electrodes are what bipolar are uh, the electrodes which are all active and they record electrical activity between two adjacent electrodes like in images this these are bipolar electrodes between they like detect electrical activity underlying and they are all active electrodes this is bipolar transfer montage transversely they detect electrical activity underlying in underlying brain structures this is bipolar transverse montage setting of the electrodes and this is bipolar longitudinal setting of the same bipolar electrodes electrodes are placed longitudinally compared to this transfer setting of the electrodes so this is something not necessarily uh, at this stage uh, to be so much concerned with uh, you must know basically these bipolar and uh, referential settings of the electrode is uh, sometimes very important to take uh, or to localize the pathology in the brain so what is abnormal EG Abnormal EG is not diagnosed for specific disease. It will just tell you there is some problem in the brain, but it will not specifically diagnose whether it is tumor, whether it is uh, some uh, electrolyte imbalance or toxic insult to the brain, drug insult to the brain, or uh, patient is having some electrical activity secondary to abnormal. Uh, brain currents associated with epilepsy so EEG is not usually not very etiology specific EEG record electrical activity of cortical neurons and thus EEG may be insensitive to dysfunction of deep structures as I told you before interactive EEG is what EEG when there is no obvious uh, tonic clonic activity or when there is no obvious Caesar activity in the patient, interacted EEG may only be abnormal in 30% of adults with epilepsy. Patients with epilepsy may have abnormal EEG or in majority of cases, interactal EEG is usually normal. What are the abnormal patterns associated with EEG? You will find focal flow activity in theta and delta range which suggests that there is some local pathology underlying brain structure like tumor or infarct when there is focal slowing activity when there is generalized flow activity it shows usually that there is some diffuse brain insert sometimes you may find sharp and spike wave discharges with or without accompanying flow waves which may be found in interactal epileptic form discharges here you can see normal EEG awake patients and this is EEG in a patient with myoclonic seizures you find abnormal electrical activity uh, starting from here and it ceases over there and from here again normal activity resumes again to show you just for comparison uh, what is normal and abnormal EEG this is normal EEG of the normal brain structures here you find abnormal 
electrical discharges starting and resuming with normal activity again. The, this one is totally abnormal EEG. You find abnormally discharging neurons. Here you see abnormal brain activity in all the leaves of the brain bilaterally. And it starts from here, again from here it resumes with normal activity. So this is a burst of electrical activity that is showing abnormal brain electrical activity and it is usually seen in case of epileptic disorders. This is EEG of typical EEG of Epsom seizures where you find three hertz spike and wave discharges. You see between one second here are three uh, hertz discharges one two three one two three one two three so three hertz spike wind discharges this type of EEG and when it is generalized it is very specific for absence epilepsy now coming to nerve connection studies and electromyography nerve connection studies basically electrical stimulus supplied over a nerve and recordings are made from surface skin electrodes you apply electrical stimulus and then you detect through recording electrode that electrical activity distally. Two types of electrodes are used, stimulating electrodes and recording electrodes. And two types of nerve conduction studies are motor nerve conduction studies and sensory nerve conduction studies. It assists in localization and type of pathology in peripheral nervous system. Starting with motor studies, it records electrical activity through recording electrodes which are placed over end plate of muscle innervated by a nerve being stimulated. Nerve is stimulated at two sides, proximal and distal, and distance between two sides is measured. What we do in motor studies, nerve conduction studies, we will look for these three things, distal latency, compound muscle action potential, and connection velocity. I will show you briefly about this. Median motor nerve conduction study. This is how this is a stimulating electrode placed over median nerve, and we apply a stimulus from this stimulating electrode. And on thinner muscles, we place recording electrodes. So these electrodes will record the waves produced by this stimulating electrode, and these waves will be displayed on the monitor. So as I said, two types of electrodes are used, stimulating and recording electrodes. This is used for stimulating and this electrode is used for recording that electrical activity and what it will show, it will show the integrity of the median nerve. If median nerve is, uh, for example, damaged over here at carpal tunnel, usually current will be slow to pass and you will see that conduction velocity will be slow sometimes even there will be absent compound muscle action potential formation in distal muscle supplied by median nerve this is motor nerve conduction study uh, amplitude for example is shown here here you apply a stimulus and you have to see in how much time this stimulus produces this amplitude or uh, compound muscle action potential and then you have to uh, differentiate comparing with normal results either it is abnormal study or normal study so you measure distal latency you measure amplitude of muscle action potential you measure overall conduction velocity of these amplitudes similarly uh, sensory nerve conduction studies are also done. Nerve is stimulated at one side and sensory nerve action potential is recorded from other side. Usually distally, that is called antidromic study or sometimes more proximally that is called orthodromic study. Like motor NCS amplitude, sensory nerve action potentials, latency and conduction velocity is measured through graphs. This is again median sensory nerve is stimulated by stimulating electrode and its sensory supply or index finger is recorded through these recording electrodes. 
this is amplitude produced by stimulation of sensory nerve here you can see sensory nerve action potential and compound muscle action potential produced by stimulating electrodes what is different between demyelinating and axonal neuropathies uh, through ncs nerve connection studies helps differentiate between demyelinating and axonal neuropathies distal latency is really prolonged or increased in case of demyelinating disease but it's normal in axonal injury conduction velocity is markedly reduced in demyelinating while normal or mildly reduced in axonal injury while compound muscle action potential amplitude is normal or mildly reduced in case of demyelinating while it is always significantly reduced in axonal injuries so nerve condition studies basically helps us in diagnosis and localization of peripheral nerve diseases starting from nerve roots up to nerve endings the other component of neurophysiology test that is usually done along with nerve connection studies emg or electromyography usually simultaneously performed with ncs needle is inserted into individual muscles recordings are made of muscle electrical activity that is called motor unit potential upon insertion which is called insertional activity and when muscle is at rest it is called spontaneous activity and during contraction of muscle which is called volitional motor unit potentials what it helps emg helps in localization of pathology within peripheral nervous system along with ncs so ncs and emg help us localization of pathology in peripheral nervous system peripheral nervous system uh, means starting from the nerve roots starting from after entry to horn cells nerve roots and then those nerves next nerve that form plexuses from plexuses to peripheral nerve peripheral nerve ending at neuromuscular junction so neuromuscular junctional disorders and muscular disorders these all disorders are assessed by ncs nerve connection study along with the help of emg electromyography for peripheral nerve dis system disorders this is very important diagnostic test this is how needle inserted in muscle and its electrical activity is monitored on the monitor i think this is uh, not so much important uh, at junior level to understand what is insertional and spontaneous activity usually insertional and spontaneous activity are those activities which are considered abnormal and depending on finding of the waveform of motor unit we can differentiate either the dis underlying disorder is neurogenic or myopathic so combined together nerve connection study and emg help identify pathology originating in entry horn cells up to peripheral cells peripheral muscles sorry this is normal motor unit potential produced by uh, electromyography testing what is the difference between uh, neurogenic and myopathic disorders on basis of emg insertional and spontaneous activity is increased in neurogenic disorders while it is normal in myopathic disorders except for necrotizing and inflammatory myopathies motor unit potentials are large amplitude uh, polyphasics with decreased recruitment in neurogenic disorders while it's small amplitude polyphasic and increased recruitment in myopathic disorders here you can see normal motor unit potential while motor unit potential in case of neuropathic 
disorders. This is motor unit potential in case of myopathic disorders. This is in myopathy, you will see small and multiple recruiting motor unit potentials compared with neuropathic uh, EMG findings in which you will find this is large amplitude motor unit action potential which is polyphasic and with uh, very low recruitment or single only single motor unit potential here you can see compared to these motor unit potentials which are rapidly recruiting and small in size so depending on these expertise on these uh, interpretation and expertise on these graph presentation you can differentiate either it is neuropathic uh, disorder underlying or it is myopathic disorder you have to insert the needle in the muscles but the recording on the monitor will show you either muscle itself is diseased or the nerve supply to the muscle is diseased in the last we will briefly discuss about these work potentials which measure electrical signals to the brain generated by sight, which is called real work potential, generated by hearing, which are called auditory work potentials, and those generated by touch, which are called somatosensory work potentials. These tests are used to assess sensory pathways and problems and confirm neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis, brain tumor, acoustic neuromas, and spinal cord injuries. Sometimes these studies are also used to assess hearing and sight, especially in infants and young children, for example, Bera. They monitor brain activity among coma patients and confirm brain death. Evoke potentials are also important sometimes to monitor brain activity in these patients with coma. In contrast to EG, which is reflection of a spontaneous electrical activity of brain, evoke potentials are generated by applied external stimuli to sensory systems. You apply external stimuli and that travels through peripheral system up to your cortical areas in the brain. It consists of complex of waveforms with positive and negative components. In work potentials, what we see basically, the either the absence of the waves or in delay in the occurrence of the wave or sometimes decrease in the amplitude of the wave. Start with real work potential, very important. It reflects what integrity of real pathway from retina, optic nerves, and cortex, and exclusively sensitive to disorders of optic nerve and optic chaos. Most commonly used for detection of asymptomatic lesions in MS, multiple sclerosis. The real stimulus is checkerboard pattern of black and white squares that reverses one to three times per second and. Uh, Potential resulting from that stimulation is measured through a scalp electrode. Here you can see checkerboard pattern. These real stimulating uh, objects are repeated in front of the patient. And this is electrode place or occipital area that detects the wave produced by this uh, sight stimulation on the uh, monitor. So, if there is dysfunction in the pathway of real pathway starting from retina up to real cortex, you will find either delayed electrical wave formation, for example, here. This is normal. Normal at normal time uh, wave formation usually around 100 to 110 milliseconds but in case of diseased uh, or sometimes dysfunction of uh, real pathway you will find there's delay in the formation of this wave over here this is delayed over here so you will see in case of optic dysfunction or real pathway dysfunction these waves either will be absent or latency of these waves will be delayed. Similarly, somatosensory work potentials in upper limbs you stimulate patient electrically, and that stimulus 
is traveled through peripheral nerves, the spinal cord, and it is detected in the parietal sensory cortex. And that parietal sensory cortex stimulation is monitored and checked to see the integrity of this somatosensory system of the patient starting from peripheral nerve up to parietal cortex, sensory cortex. You have to see the specific wave formation occurs or it is delayed or it is absent and it will show the integrity of this sensory system. Similarly, auditory work potentials for hearing loss and other uh, pathologies in the pathway of uh, auditory brainstem, auditory system, and you give uh, sound stimulus through these earphones, and this is detected via these electrodes placed on the vault of the uh, skull, and one electrode is placed around the mastoid area of the concerned ear. And after these clicks, through these electrodes, you measure and see the specific wave formation. If it is absent, it shows some dysfunction in the pathway starting from the peripheral auditory system up to uh, cortex or in, in, in this whole auditory cortex area that includes as well brain stem. So basically this auditory book potentials, again, if it is abnormal or uh, if there is some uh, disturbance in its pathway, these waves either will be absent or they will be delayed uh, and their formation will be delayed. So again, this is very advanced uh, interpretation, not at the level of undergraduate level, but you should know that these auditory work potentials are also neurophysiological tests that are performed to assess hearing as well as sometimes to see the integrity of brain stem and auditory structures in the brain. So this was all about uh, some of the important neurological tests.